this is a case of circumstantial evidence. It's what Mr. Johnston said when he stood up here in front of you. I don't disagree with that. DNA itself is circumstantial evidence. It says that someone's DNA is there, but it doesn't tell you how it got there, right? That's what circumstantial evidence is. It's, it's evidence that does not have that direct source that someone's going to sit up there and tell you that they heard it, they saw it. That doesn't make it any less effective or any less true or mean that you give it any less weight. We said that in the beginning, that you as jurors get to evaluate the evidence and that you get to put the amount of weight on any one given piece of evidence that you want to put on it and use that to paint the picture. There's circumstantial evidence in this case because no one else was there to see the defendant murder his family. One important factor in this case that everybody keeps talking about is evidence and what evidence existed but let's not forget that the absence of evidence is also evidence. And ladies and gentlemen, there's a whole lot missing from those cameras. And there's a whole lot missing from those cameras because there was not an intruder. The defendant wants you to believe, ladies and gentlemen, that sometime during the early morning hours of June 15, 2021, the black guy in all black with a ski mask and gloves and green shoes is lurking around this secluded cul-de-sac full of affluent people who are out walking their dogs and enjoying their morning and no one saw him. And no video cameras picked him up, including the four video cameras attached to the Jackson home and the camera across the street that live streams everything. It doesn't stop. Investigator Denlinger told you that he watched six hours of footage from the Nest camera, from the Yang house, and there was nothing. We can go back and forth about what happened to the backyard camera. We looked into it. We can't prove it one way or another. It's, it's very coincidental, though, that the one camera in the Jackson household that could confirm the defendant's story about the random black guy in all black with green shoes and a ski mask and gloves made it to that back door and didn't get picked up on the camera that caught Alexander Jackson walking the exact same path the night before. I don't know what happened to the camera. We couldn't prove it. Had experts look at it, they analyzed it. For whatever reason, it didn't work, but that's coincidence. None of the other neighborhood cameras found this person. And then Mr. Johnston stands up here, and now the story is that when the defendant heard the gunshots, he ran out the back door and came down the steps and then went around to the back door and in, and that didn't pick him up on camera either. Mr. Johnston made a big deal about the state not being able to prove motive in this case. When you look at your jury instructions and you look at the elements of the crimes that the state is required to prove, motive isn't on there. Motive isn't on there and the state is not required to prove motive. We can lodge some guesses. He talked about being the, the um, kid home from summer vacation and his dad wanting him to get a job and him getting ready to be kicked out of the house and if he doesn't have a job then he's out with thirty dollars in his bank account the the oddball of the family the black sheet of the family who stays up all night gaming with his friends is suddenly going to have to step into the real world and get a job and be a man motive the fact that he only has $30 left over is the money the motive? Is the fact that he's going to inherit houses and assets and all of that, is that motive? I don't know, but guess what I don't have to prove? That motive. No matter what motive, no matter what reason that the state would present to a group of rational-minded jurors is never going to be motive enough for you to think, gosh, that's a good reason. That's a good enough reason why this kid killed his parents. There's never going to be a good enough reason why Alexander Jackson executed his entire family. Mr. Johnston wants to talk about murder cases that happened in 1959 and, you know, motives there. And 
How many murders do you hear in the newspaper or on the news as his source where there's never a motive why a school shooting happens or why this or why that or why some kid decides one day that he's going to walk into a building and execute kindergartners? It's never going to be a good enough reason to kill your whole family. That's why we don't have to prove motive because it's irrelevant. The defendant on this fentanyl is so doped up and euphoric that he can't form thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, you get to see and hear how the defendant responds and how the defendant reacts when he's at home laying in that hallway with his foot wrapped up. You get to hear his tone of voice. You get to hear how he answers every question with a question and the weird inflection in his noise. That doesn't change before the fentanyl or after the fentanyl. The idea that 320 pounds and 100 migs of fentanyl is going to make him so ill lucid that he cannot form rational thought and he can't explain to you the details that just happened. My family was just executed. My dad is laying in front of me in a pool of blood with gunshot wounds. And I can't tell you any more than that limited information that he just gave. That makes no sense, ladies and gentlemen. The only person that Alexander Jackson was worried about on June 15th was himself because he slips in a couple sentences. Is my mom okay? Is my sister okay? He never had concern for his father. He never checked on his sister. He never checked on his mother. He never called out their names. He never crawled an extra four inches to peek around the corner to see if his sister whom was laying in bed was okay. Never tried to resuscitate his father. Never shook him. Never told the 911 caller, listen, it's just my foot. Who cares? My dad is laying here dying, if not dead. The only person that Alexander Jackson cared about on June 15th was himself, ladies and gentlemen. And that's because he killed his family members. He has to make himself look like the victim. There's four victims in this household. There's three victims in this household and one murderer. And that murderer is Alexander Jackson. Mr. Hyam, Mr. Hyam basically took the stand and said that none of the K-9 units used in police agencies across the United States are any good because that's not how he learned it in Germany back in the 1990s. He doesn't think that he should be certified in any of the certifiable programs that are used by law enforcement agencies across this country because he just doesn't think they're good enough. If you look at Mr. Hyen's CV, his curriculum vitae, which is the same thing as a resume, any notable experience that he had was in the 90s. 90s doesn't sound like that far away when you think about it, but that's over 30 years ago. He wants to say, oh, there's a couple things missing from the early 2000s. But he also said that if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. You can't even keep your resume up to date and you're coming in here testifying as an expert witness because some dog class that you took in the late 80s and early 90s tells you that German dogs do it better than all of the police forces in, in, in the United States do it. It's a joke. He contradicted himself so many times that I don't even know what his testimony was. In one minute, he's saying, this is where the entry point to the backyard should have been. This is, this is where Officer Buckle should have started that track. And then he points at the area that was most heavily contaminated by EMTs and law enforcement agencies. And then he says, well, the dog can't smell human odor. The dog can only pick up vegetation. It's too hot for the dog to do any tracking. Wait, ladies and gentlemen, right here, Officer Buckles is pulling him, pulling the dog away from, from a verifiable scent. You can see the way the dog puts their nose down that they smell something. Well, which is it? The dog can't smell or the dog can smell? Then he says, again, you know, as the dog gets closer to the house, it's too hot, and I, and I quote this, it's, it's too hot, it's dangerous for the dog to be working in this heat. Not two seconds later, he says, look how the dog picked up that track, but we're not going to count that track because that's a contaminated area where the officers went. Dogs can't trot across concrete, and dogs can't. Dogs can smell illnesses. Dogs find people buried under rubble after explosions. Dogs do all these amazing things, which is why they're used. But because Mr. Hyen got a training class in the 90s 
from Germany. We're just supposed to discredit all of the canine work, both medical and emergent and law enforcement that canines do in this country because Mr. Hyen said it's not good. Stop it. The common sense that Mr. Johnston talked about, that I talked about, the version of events that the defendant wants you to believe in this case is an insult to common sense and to reason. The defense stood up in front of you and talked about if there's two differing stories, then that's doubt. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that in any criminal case, unless you were there to see it yourself or the entire crime was captured on video, there's some doubt and there should be. And that's what you as rational and reasonable and commonsensical jurors get to analyze and decide. But reasonable doubt and we talked about this in Vordire. Reasonable doubt is more than the mere possibility of doubt or the mere possibility of innocence. Possibility doesn't make something reasonable. What the defense wants you to believe in this case when they're arguing reasonable doubt in order for, for that theory or those theories to create that reasonable doubt is a couple of things. First, for the defendant's story to make sense, what Alexander Jackson told police officers and EMTs and 911 operators is that on June 15th, 2021, this intruder gets into the neighborhood, whether coming from Usher Ferry Road or from Oak Leaf Court, up Scarlet Court, whatever that street is, that, that this intruder makes it into the neighborhood, into the backyard of the Jacksons, and he is not seen by anyone or any cameras. No one, nothing picks him up. And that in picking this random house, that is secured by cameras, but not by locked doors, that he picks the, the random house with the back door unlocked. Even though on the video camera, the front door is locked, the garage door is locked, all doors are locked in this house, except that basement door. Lucky, coincidental. Then you have to believe that this armed intruder came into this house for one of two purposes. Both of those purposes fit into the definition of burglary, which is why that word's been thrown around and why the defense keeps saying to you, no one said burglary, did they? But when you break and enter into a house with the intent to either steal something commit a theft or commit a felony within, that's a burglary. That's where that word comes from. So what you would have to believe as jurors that this burglar, this intruder, makes it into this backyard, isn't seen, finds the house, surrounded by cameras, one coincidentally off, picks the door that isn't locked, and comes into the house to either steal stuff or hurt people. Now. We're gonna break into a house and want to steal things, whether that be guns or jewels or money or whatever, and we don't steal anything. Nothing's stolen, nothing's ransacked, nothing's gone through. 
okay? Or you're breaking in to hurt someone. But then you don't bring your own weapon. So, after we've made it to the backyard and to the house without being caught on camera, and we find the unlocked door, and we go in with this intent to do one of the two things, there was the proposition that, well, maybe he's in there to steal guns. Maybe he is. Or he's in there to hurt people. No weapon. Even the 911 operator, you got shot with your own gun? And then you find this gun to which the defendant said was unloaded and left on the fireplace from the night before. A gun that the defendant went out of his way to say was his father's and a tribute to his dad. It's my dad's gun. It's my dad's gun. I'm not sure where we store it. You store it under your bed because it's your gun. The box that this is stored in is stored under your bed, and it is stored in two pieces. The other guns in the house were in the master bedroom or locked in a safe that there was no key to. This gun is the defendant's gun. It's his 22 Browning rifle, semi-automatic. It's his Eagle Scout gun, ladies and gentlemen, that he's comfortable with. In the hospital, he's even explaining how he cleans it and takes it apart because that's the gun that he's familiar with. Box under his bed. So the defendant comes in and the only in one box, according to the defendant of ammunition, that this family owns for this gun is also sitting out neatly next to the gun on the fireplace mantle and this burglar or murderer or whoever just loads this gun and goes on a killing spree and in no specific order, assassinates and executes Sabrina Jackson, assassinates and executes Jan Jackson, goes upstairs, assassinates and executes Melissa Jackson, comes back downstairs with at least four bullets in this gun, ladies and gentlemen. The defendant, after hearing all of these gunshots, wakes up, and runs downstairs. We're supposed to believe he went out the back door and in. And runs into this intruder. And pushes him. And wrestles with him. And struggles over this gun. Leaving only perfect, good quality palm prints on the butt of this gun that they're struggling over. And the defendant gets shot in the foot. Then he says he falls. So after the struggle and the pushing and him getting shot in the foot, he says he falls down. And you can picture this in your head, right? That this intruder is standing over the defendant who's laying there, bleeding from the foot. Point blank range like the intruder likes it, right? Like he executed Melissa Jackson and Sabrina Jackson and put two in the back of the head of Jan Jackson. He's standing there with the defendant on the floor. And then he just decides, you know what? I have reached my kill quota for the day. I'm going to let this guy live. The one guy who can identify me, the one guy who struggled with me, the one guy who's going to be able to call the police. We're just going to let one shot to the foot is good enough for him. We're going to leave that guy alone with three bullets left in my chamber. And then I'm going to put the gun down, and I'm going to run back out the back door, Nobody's going to chase me. No one who's trained in rifling through the Eagle Scouts is going to pick up that gun and fire any shots in my direction, is not going to hoop and holler for help, is not going to follow me out the back door, nothing. I'm going to put the gun down, and I'm going to leave out the back door. That's where the intruder went. Ladies and gentlemen, that makes zero common sense. Zero. Mr. Johnson stands up here and suddenly he's an expert in bloody footprints and void marks and... There 
there aren't any bloody footprints going into that bedroom where the defendant said his phone was. There is blood spatter in there. There is a deep-seated blood spot next to the bed where you see those spatter marks. There's no shell casing in there. There's no shell casing around the other dark spot behind the couch. Both of those areas, and you see them in the photograph, and Investigator Bosenberg testified to, were cut up, and there's no bullet. Do remember what the defendant was playing with when the officers had that oh crap moment and realized that they left the defendant downstairs unattended with a loaded gun? When they came back down those stairs, the defendant's playing with a shell casing. shot didn't hurt as bad as he thought he would. The defense, ladies and gentlemen, stood up here and clicked through a bunch of family pictures and accused the state of trying to inflame the passions of the jury. You're smarter than that. They, they want you to find some significance and some relevance in the fact that when Sabrina and Alexander Jackson were little and they went on a bunch of family vacations that this family was happy. I'm sure they were. I hope they were. What you don't see in any of those photographs are any pictures that are recent of this family. And you ask yourself what goes on behind closed doors and you don't know. No recent family photos. And witness after witness after witness that the defense put up, they did a good job of testifying about the defendant's character four or five years ago. The same four or five years ago, if not more, that you see in these photographs. There aren't recent family pictures of the Jacksons hanging on those walls. The only recent pictures of the Jacksons are then laid out on a cold slab in the medical examiner's office. Because the defendant murdered his family, ladies and gentlemen. That's the only scenario in this situation that makes sense. That's the only scenario in this situation that is supported by and consistent with the evidence that was found. This was not some random intruder that breaks in and executes a family that he doesn't know with a gun that he didn't bring with the hope to steal things that are never stolen. Where there's a struggle with a huge man and a tall man, a black man with green shoes wearing all black and a ski mask with gloves on. Makes no sense. The murder in this case that you're looking for, ladies and gentlemen, is seated right behind me. And that murderer is Alexander Jackson. And I submit to you that when you go back to deliberate this case and you look at the facts and review the evidence and check the cameras and watch them yourself and listen to calls and judge and give weight to everything that you've received in this trial, there is only one conclusion that you as jurors are going to be able to reach and that is that this defendant is guilty of all three counts of murder in the first degree. Thank you.